Launching the Antiquities Act of 1906, President Teddy Roosevelt created the nation's first national monument designation, Devil's Tower National Monument in Wyoming. The important purpose of this act was to preserve, for all Americans, significant pieces of the country's history. Ecology. Geology, and beauty. But unlike America's great national parks, size is not important for monuments. Historic sites and other units of the national park system Monuments are typically established by presidential proclamation, chosen as their personal memorials of the most special parts of this great country. However, occasionally these units of the park system are established by the direct action of Congress. Some are big, some are small. Some garner large budgets and staff, others next to none. And some eventually gain national park designation. America's treasures tell the story of the nation's past and present glory. The intrepid mountain men of the Rockies. It was a short but epic era when a hardy breed of men battled the elements and overcame great dangers, all in search of enormous wealth. Not wealth in the form of gold, but wealth in the form of animal pelts, particularly beaver pelts. Wonderfully, the National Park Service, with its foresight and wisdom, has set aside and reconstructed two forts that captured the flavor and the excitement of that era. The era when beaver pelts ruled the wilderness. Forts over 1,800 miles apart. Forts not in the Rockies. Forts near the Canadian border where voyagers and merchants gathered to exchange goods and money. Myself dressed as a guide or an interpreter, my salary would be between 350 and 450 French livre, uh, which is a currency no longer in existence, but um, our equivalency in dollars today, we're talking between five and 6,000 bucks. Um, that said, back in the day, in our equivalency, a loaf of bread would cost five cents. So they're doing pretty good. They're doing well enough to start buying the extreme hats and fitting the plumes and they have more cooking gear and they have their own tents. Uh, we see a lot more blankets and some finery as far as uh, a couple pieces of china, which is um, sort of unheard of for their class. So they're doing pretty well here. Not only was great wealth at stake during the heyday of these two forts, but even more importantly, the boundary between the United States of America and British colonial Canada was to be determined during this time. One fort on the western side of the Rockies, Fort Vancouver National Historic Site, was where waters that originated in the mountains of the Pacific Northwest carried trappers and voyagers to the Pacific Ocean. The other fort on the eastern side of the Rockies Grand Portage National Monument is where the beaver pelts from the Canadian interior, the land of many lakes, connected these waterways and their wealth to the Great Lakes and civilization to the east.
The American Boundary Waters region stretches from Isle Royale and Lake Superior on the east to Voyagers National Park on the west. In between, it contains the Boundary Waters Canoe Area Wilderness, the largest pristine wilderness in the lower 48 states. It is an area with over 1,000 icy clear blue water lakes. An area of well over a million acres of pristine nature. Unchanged since the last ice age. And the Boundary Waters also contain Grand Portage National Monument. Designated a monument in 1958 by President Dwight D. Eisenhower, it is an area in present-day Minnesota where French-Canadian voyagers gather to exchange their trade goods. Goods canoed across the Boundary Waters, many lakes, and reportage from the 1750s until the mid-1800s. Indeed, the Voyager's route through the Boundary Waters defines the Canadian-U.S. border. Grand Portage National Monument lies entirely within the boundaries of the Grand Portage Ojibwe Indian Reservation. The first thing the visitor sees is the wooden stockade walls that contain the reconstructed British Northwest Company fort and trading post. At the height of its glory in 1797, it is believed that the stockade looked like this. Sixteen wooden buildings stood within the palisade. Outside the walls were gardens, a warehouse, and a permanent workers camp. Everybody was making a lot of money. One of the partners said was, are we rich or are we stinking rich? The Northwest Company operated in this area from uh, about 1780s to 1802 when uh, we moved lock, stock and barrel up to what's now Thunder Bay. It was a time when the fort was the most profitable fur trading operation in the Great Lakes. Today, inside the stockade, the two main buildings, the Great Hall, built in French colonial style, and the kitchen have been reconstructed. Each summer, a great rendezvous of reenactors head to the monument to celebrate and relive the Boundary Waters fur trade days in the Ojibwe way of life. Once again, those colorful days of the fur trading rendezvous come back to life. In the days of these voyagers, the majority of the beaver lived on Native American land and French territory. And the best routes back to Europe were controlled by the British. A unique and profitable partnership developed, one where the Native Americans were treated as equals. All three groups worked together to get the valuable beaver pelts from inland North America to Europe. However, once they hit the last 20 miles of the Pigeon River, they had to portage, what was called the Grand Portage, a nine-mile trail bypassing the Pigeon River Gorge and Falls, finally reaching Lake Superior, a trail that voyagers had to carry canoes and their 90-pound packs of pelts on their backs to the British Northwest Company Fort. At the same time as the rendezvous, the Ojibwe people put on a powerful powwow, confirming their heritage. The Ojibwe are the largest tribe of Algonquin-speaking people in eastern Canada and northeastern United States. 
the celebration brings us all together. You know, this is why I came up here is, is you know, to get out of my area and come up and, and hang out with other Anishinaabe people and also the, the non uh, the non natives, I guess. Our friends too. So just a good time to get out and dance and pray and and uh, you know, healing too. The drum is um is the it's called the heartbeat of our nation and there's um some different teachings that go along with carrying a drum and, and singing on the drum and um it's all part of uh, the circle of life you say. All in all, it is a time of great celebration. Eventually, the fur trading days disappeared, and a new breed of people looked to recapture the solitude and beauty of the boundary waters. A solitude the visitors to the Boundary Waters area and Grand Portage National Monument can relive. Relive the days of old of those early voyagers. The geology of the Boundary Waters, and Grand Portage National Monument in particular, is first and foremost about the core of the North American continent. The first surface area to emerge out of the Earth's primeval seas. It is a geology that may go back as far as the beginning of the planet, when what is known as the Canadian Shield was built. It is a vast area that formed at the time of the Laurentian mountain building event, the nucleus of the North American continent. When the crust forming geology of this era subsided, the mineral rich heart of the continent was in place. Indeed, each step in the early creation of the continent is geologically present in the Boundary Waters. Lee Grimm has been a park interpretive ranger, a geologist, a biologist, and now works on Boundary Waters preservation projects. He knows the geology of the area better than most. Lee took us on a boat trip to see some of these very early rocks in the Greenstone Belt. We're in the middle of Jackfish Bay West End on a small island, and uh, we have some examples here of two geologic things, at least. First of all, um, we're standing on some schist, which is a metamorphic rock. It used to be sediments, maybe even volcanic ash and things like that. And if you'll notice uh, down here in the bottom on this bedrock, you'll see all kinds of small little pebbles. And they all seem to be running in the same direction, don't they? And they're running kind of to the northeast and to the southwest. And then if you look carefully here, you can see remnants of the ancient bedding planes. See here's pink, here's dark, and so on, and they all seem to be running in the same direction, don't they? And embedded within those beds of silt or sand or whatever the case may be, are these small pebbles. What people think happened to cause this is there was volcanism going on and earthquake activity going on here at the beginning of the continent's formation. So all of these rocks here represent a tremendous period of ancient volcanism and mountain building. Mountains that at one time might have rivaled the Rockies of today. A mountain building process that began 2.5 billion years ago and ended approximately 570 million years ago. Then after millions of years, Erosion left a relatively flat core of the continent. However, 
It was a more recent event that put the final touches on the Boundary Waters geology. Glaciation. Approximately 190,000 years ago, the Pleistocene Ice Age epoch began. Multiple times, glaciers extended into present-day Grand Portage National Monument in the Boundary Waters. The glacier scooped out the Lake Superior Basin and smoothed many of the granites and rocks of the region. They left behind unconsolidated rocks, sediments, and thin soils resting on top of the oldest North American rocks. The result is a relatively flat area of large basins occupied by a myriad of lakes, smaller ponds, and the area's many wetlands, all interconnected by a visually stunning network of waterways. Waterways that are all part of the Boundary Waters and Grand Portage National Monument experience. Fort Vancouver National Historic Site is one of the great urban units in the national park system. Sandwiched between Vancouver, Washington to the north and the great urban center of Portland, Oregon to the south. It rests on the north bank of the Great Columbia River. On a clear day, Mount Hood's perpetually snowy peak is visible from the park. Crowned by 11 glaciers, one for every thousand feet it rises above sea level. The 11,240 foot volcano is one of a number of active volcanoes in the Cascade Mountain Range, which includes Mount St. Helens and Mount Rainier. Continuing east along the Columbia River, is the Columbia River Gorge. The gorge holds federally protected status as the Columbia Gorge National Scenic Area. It is a canyon of the Columbia River up to 4,000 feet deep that stretches over 80 miles as the river winds westward through the Cascade Mountain Range. It also contains some of the most powerful hydroelectric plants in the world. Throughout the gorge, many falls cascade into the Columbia River, including Multnomah Falls, a waterfall as magnificent and memorable as any in the country, a falls that is located just a 30-minute drive from Fort Vancouver. The Columbia River itself is the largest river in the Pacific Northwest. The river begins in the Rocky Mountains of British Columbia, Canada. It flows northwest and then south into the state of Washington, then turns west to form most of the border between Washington and Oregon, before emptying into the Pacific Ocean. The river is 1,243 miles long, and its largest tributary is the Snake River. It was all part of the Great Columbia River Fur Trade Network, a network that was at the heart of Pacific Northwest commerce in the early 19th century. Commerce controlled by the London-based Hudson's Bay Company. Everything here in the shop is priced in the value of the beaver. So you trade your furs in, so two otters equal one beaver, two foxes, or four wolves, or 15 minks. So beaver accounted for about a third of what we shipped from here. So that's, we always encourage people to bring in beaver for making hats. This inner fur, uh, once the outer fur was plucked off by the hat maker, uh, this got shaved off and then mixed with various chemicals and steam and a 30-step process in making a hat which looked like that. 
and they say you could stand on a beaver hat. It, it's such, you know, it's so tightly held together. The Hudson's Bay Company established historic Fort Vancouver in 1825 to serve as the headquarters of the company's West of the Rockies fur trade. The first Fort Vancouver was a failure. As a result, in 1829, a second fort was built in this location. This fort served as the vibrant core of the Hudson's Bay Company's Western operations, controlling the fur business from Russian Alaska to Mexican California, and from the Rocky Mountains to the Pacific Ocean. Rivaling San Francisco, Fort Vancouver and Fort Vancouver Village were the principal colonial settlements in the Pacific Northwest and a major center of industry, trade, and law. In 1948, President Harry S. Truman signed into law the creation of Fort Vancouver National Monument. Congress expanded the protected area in 1966 and redesignated the site as a National Historic Site. Today, the first thing the visitor sees, like travelers to the fort over 170 years ago, is the garden. The garden, where we did not expect to meet such perfection in gardening. About five acres laid out in good order, stored with almost every species of vegetables, fruit trees, and flowers. Henry Spalding, 1836. The wooden palisades of the fort were not built for protection, but for the wealthy people of the Hudson's Bay Company to live and conduct business. Inside, surrounding the central courtyard and punctuated by the British flagpole, restored buildings abound, including the bastion in one corner, the carpenter shop, the blacksmith shop, and a number of buildings on the west end of the courtyard. Throughout the year, during special events and celebrations, the old fort comes alive, comes alive with living history demonstrations. Just outside the Palisades, Fort Vancouver Village, established in 1829, was one of the largest settlements in the West during its time. A diverse population of English, French Canadian, Scottish, Irish, and people from over 30 different regional Native American groups. They brought with them the guns used by the mountain men, voyagers, settlers, that pushed west across North America. Housing the workers, their families, and the fur brigades when they returned from their expeditions, the population of the village exceeded 600 people during peak times. However, in 1844, more Americans from the east poured into the region and a boundary dispute broke out between the U.S. and British Canada. The United Kingdom wanted a border that followed the Columbia River to the Pacific Ocean. The U.S. wanted the border to start at Russian Alaska. The dispute was resolved in the Oregon Treaty of 1846, which established the 49th parallel as the boundary through the Rockies. Fort Vancouver and the village were now part of the United States. During the late 1840s and early 1850s, slowing returns from trapping and the over 300,000 settlers from the east that poured into the region along the Oregon Trail resulted in a shift from the fur brigades to land-based mercantile opportunities. To keep peace in the region, the U.S. sent its army. 
Arriving in 1849, the Army and the Hudson's Bay Company coexisted amicably at first. However, the relations between the Army and Fort Vancouver in the latter half of the 1850s soured. Finally, in June of 1860, the Hudson's Bay Company moved its operations to Victoria, British Columbia. It marked the end of a colorful era, the end of the time of the voyagers, a time when beaver pelts ruled the American wilderness. The old fort no longer bustled with traders and trappers, but men in U.S. military uniforms. Thanks to the U.S. Park Service, those fur trading days can be relived at Fort Vancouver National Historic Site.